Welcome to a CNBC Africa special and today we look at the impact of COVID-19 on Rwanda's trade and industry. We sit down with the country's Minister for Trade and Industry, Soraya Hakuzi Aremie, and we're going to be discussing that and potential opportunities from this black swan moment. Now, do you want to be part of this conversation? Tweet us at CNBC Africa or you could tag me directly at The Real Quizera to be part of the conversation. Thank you for making the time and thank you for joining us, Madam Minister. Uh, Let's start from uh, the changes in 2020. Yeah, we no one foresaw this coming. Um, how, how has COVID-19 had an impact on trade in Rwanda? The COVID-19 uh, impact on our economy has been, but also what the government response has been so far. But before maybe dwelling into uh, the impact on industry and trade in Rwanda, um, I would first maybe you know speak about the the impact of the pandemic uh, globally. Uh, what we've seen so far is really a completely new, um, I would say, experience new crisis as it was, um, you know, and it still is a result of a global pandemic. And uh, it's also, um, you know, one uh, situation where we had shocks both on the supply side and on the demand side. And, and the combination of both is really unprecedented. When we look at, uh, you know, uh, what the responses from governments across the world have been in, in imposing total lockdowns in most countries, shutting down economies at the same time, uh, banning international travels, um, and then in the same time really fighting a pandemic that sort of was across all countries. Uh, this is unprecedented and, and the economic crisis that, that we, we, we're seeing now, but also the social impact uh, is something that's very complex to navigate. Coming to Rwanda specifically, uh, of course, our industrial sector was affected, especially during the lockdown period, which was from 21st of March to 4th of May. However, we had seen really a robust uh, growth in our manufacturing sector up until March. And of course, April was really um, a month where uh, all activities apart from food processing was put to a halt. However, when we see the growth we've seen in the industrial sector, it's about 12% uh, from January to July compared to last year. However, that growth is a bit lower than the growth we had seen in previous years. Uh, like last year, the industrial sector at the same period was growing at 17%. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just there to intervene a little bit there. Uh, 17 percent last year, 12 percent growth this year, 5 percent decline. Understandable. Where do you think Rwanda as a country should have been uh, had we not had this uh, black swan moment? So if we look at um, our forecast for, for GDP growth overalls across, uh, um, uh, across all, all, all sectors, we were really projecting to even reach at, at 10 percent. Last year we had a 9.4 percent GDP growth. However, this year, as you've seen, really the forecast is only at 2 percent uh, by World Bank. So we're hoping that uh, the second half of, of the year of 2020, we can uh, sort of recover what we've lost across all sectors um, um, in, in our economy. Um, as far as if I come back to, to manufacturing sector, um, you know, the fact that since May, we see really the recovery being steadfast. However, there are uh, some sectors that still have to recover quickly being construction, mining, and also energy sector. Um, for instance, we had seen that the first half of 2019, construction had managed to grow at 36%. I don't think we will reach that anytime soon. However, we see a 2.5% growth from January to July. Um, and and uh, secondly, the decline in mining, um, one, due to lower volumes, but also some of the minerals uh, prices that had gone down. Although thanks to gold, we see that that sector is, is, is picking up as well, but not at the level that we would have wished. If I look at the trade sector uh, itself, of course, what has seen an impact is one, um, our export, as most of our, our um, export markets were closing at the same time as ours. Second, the demand has not uh, fully picked up, but I think we can talk more about where we see our exports going um, in the near future as well. We have that 5% uh, fall off uh, from last year, still a 12% growth uh, there. But uh, if I may ask, 
Rwanda as a government, you had to react, right, initially, and then from that have to be proactive uh, in order to tackle these challenges. Uh, what are the precautions, the measures that have been taken deliberately to ensure that these industries bounce back? At the forefront, of course, what we wanted, uh, um, you know, the response of the government was to make sure that we can really contain the pandemic. And, and, and avoid, um, I would say, a full-scale uh, infection in our population, which I think we have sort of managed. And these were really strict measures put in place, uh, being the lockdowns themselves, but also after the lockdown, making sure that as activities resume, we really um, you know, adhere to, to, to health guidelines, and, and it's something that will continue. Um, on, on the uh, economic recovery side, there's an economic recovery plan that the government put in place with five uh, key priorities. Uh, the first one being, one, of course, contain the pandemic with all the health measure, related measures that have to put in place and also investments in our health sectors. The second priority was really to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on households uh, with a uh, scale of social protection measures. Uh, and third, making sure that we can really be self-sufficient, especially in the food sector. We were lucky enough that one, our agricultural sector was not as impacted uh, by the COVID-19. And in the, it's also a sector that the government had invested heavily in so that we really make sure that we have food security. Fourth um, priority, of course, was support businesses and make sure that they can protect jobs. And the last one is, uh, you know, a coordinated cross-sectoral um, sectoral response to really uh, restart and boost economic activity, which includes, of course, the Economic Recovery Fund um, that all sectors are eligible for um, uh, with, with subsidized uh, loans um, for working capital, but also measures that have been uh, put in place uh, in our banking sector to make sure that uh, our private sector has access and can restructure their ongoing loans and have also moratorium to give them sort of a breathing room to kickstart their activities. Yeah, I mean, so just want to start with the last point, which is the Economic Recovery Fund. That was, as I said, uh, going, if we just bypass the people who are eligible to it mm -hmm. as well, uh, uh, it's expected impact, right? Uh, one sees this as, you know, uh, when we look back at uh, previous crises in history, 2008, uh, before 2008, you look at uh, 1930, after World War II, uh, all those economic shocks that have been around previously. Fiscal policy, which this seems to stem from quite a lot, is the direction Rwanda seems to have taken with this. Um, uh, the long-term impact of, you know, having a largely focus on this, uh, couldn't this come back to bite us? Um, I believe all, all governments across the world have had to take, I would say, unconventional measures. Um, uh, of course, we know our tax base um, uh, is being impacted, but if you don't support your own private sector, you won't have any tax revenues. So uh, the fiscal measures were needed. Um, they are temporary, but really the biggest, um, I think that the, the, the biggest um, challenge that we had is to make sure that Although we, our first priority is to protect citizens, uh, which, which also meant um, making sacrifices and really shutting down the economy. Um, uh, although it, one, it's, it's still a small economy, developing economy, and we knew the impact would be huge. However, these mitigating uh, measures, um, be it in, 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 in tax moratorium, in, in, in um, also waiving taxes, especially for the hospitality sector, this is something that the sector need to sort of um, make sure that they can mitigate the impact, not close totally. Um, there's always a debate between, you know, do we take fiscal measures? Do we uh, support, um, you know, our economy? And it's a debate that, that's, a, you know, I, I think it's, 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 it's a valid debate. However, you know, the, the argument we always put forward is if we don't have 
uh, businesses functioning, what tax are we going to have? So that's the balance we've had to make. But I think through ongoing dialogue between government and private sector, we've, um, we, we've really um, you know, come to a sort of compromise. And, and, as, and, and we look at how also you know, each sector is, is, is um, recovering and, and adapting the measures accordingly. Uh, Minister, recovery, uh, the income inequality is a big risk uh, in terms of uh, lots of informal businesses uh, which uh, largely form the biggest chunk of our economy. Uh, many of these are very, the SMEs are very substantial in nature of how they operate. Yeah, um, there's a, a feeling that with the recovery fund many of those smaller businesses, substantial uh, businesses, may not have access to this. And that gives a, puts us you know, in a position, or in a risk of just increasing our income inequality, which the country had done, uh, had to fight and you know, bridge that gap. Don't we uh, risk falling back into that same trap? Eh? I think there's a misperception that this recovery fund uh, is geared towards uh, large companies. This is untrue. There's a, a window for, for SMEs, uh, which also has a component on um, guarantees, so collateral that, that, that they have to put up uh, to access a loan, but there's a guarantee window um, access to SMEs. But you're right in the fact that we still have a large informal sector, and then to be eligible to any loan, you have to have registered a business. Uh, however, there's a, um, a new entrepreneurship development policy that was a approved by cabinet in April uh, that has to be implemented by our ministry, the Ministry of Trade and Industry, which also targets um, you know, the informal sector. How do we make sure that we can um, sort of um, not only give trainings, but also uh, encourage people to sort of uh, come into the formal sector, uh, showing them what it is um, that, 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 that actually the benefits of formalizing. There's still a perception out there that if you're a formal sector, then you have to pay taxes, then you're not making profits. But then I think with this pandemic also, some of uh, actually be it in the small scale uh, manufacturers, uh, and we have them now that are registering through RDB. There are some subsidies you cannot access if you've not come into the pharma sector. Um, a second point I wanted to raise is also the fact that our um, companies, um, more than 90% of them are still micros and small. And, and, and the, 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 um, I would say the, the support um, that, that, that those companies need is, is somewhat different from what the large companies are. And it's another already challenge that we had pre-COVID. But with the pandemic, these are really vulnerable um, enterprises that we want to make sure that they don't fall back into informal sector or close altogether. Um, but the good news is we're working with some uh, business advisory organizations, uh, being, uh, I would give an example, um, be it BPN or, or or even in Homoko, the MasterCard Foundation has come in, um, uh, you know, rapidly to also really focus on the small, uh, micro and small enterprises. And I think through also that partnership, uh, we are um, making sure that you know the the, the small and micro enterprises get um, also the, the support that they need uh, currently. Minister, earlier you talked about agriculture, uh, and agriculture was key to. Uh, the deficit in the balance of trade position in the of the country in the past. Uh, we saw just before COVID-19 happened, going by the National Institute of Statistics Randa numbers uh, regarding inflation, um, they, we saw an increase, especially in consumer products. And, you know, we're talking the basics here, beans, portion, that uh, an average household could be able to afford. Uh, uh, when, when we move when we went into the COVID-19 pandemic, there was also a, you know, a gradual increase in that. So you talked about Rwanda being able to scale down its balance of uh, trade position in when it comes to agriculture. How has it done that? And uh, when should we expect that to be reflective uh, of uh, possibly National Institute of Statistics Rwanda uh, numbers? 
Um, th there was one measure that we put in place, especially at the beginning of lockdown, making sure that, you know, um, traders uh, do not take advantage of the pandemic to hike prices, um, you know, uh, especially on essential products being food, but also the sanitation products that we needed. And as a ministry, we had to really uh, put in place fixed prices on a number of essential products. Of course, we're still an open economy where we want demand and supply to be the ones uh, regulating the market, but these were really um, extraordinary times. And, and I think uh, through engagements and discussions with the private sector, we had to show them that one, um, most of the products, especially food products, are grown here, and there hadn't been any shortage of, of uh, or, or any any impact on the agricultural production. And then, you know, having those prices in place, I think, has helped a little bit. Of course, we cannot regulate prices of all products unless we see really that there's speculation on it. Uh, imported uh, products, of course, some of those um, have seen their prices go up as one, there's uh, you know transport cost that comes into it and with delays uh, across land borders that has an impact. Second, the fact that some of the countries we were importing being capital goods in or even some of the essential products we need if you look at uh, medical supplies, for instance, medicines, but also some of the sanitation products which we have not yet been able to produce enough locally. Uh, that has an impact, of course, on, on price hikes and inflation. But we're um, optimistic that you know that the, 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 the this quarter and the next quarter of the year we can see uh, prices stabilizing. Not all of them, but we continue to monitor that trend. NST1, uh, Rwanda had set certain targets, and one of those was annual export growth uh, to get to about 17 percent. That's by 2024. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, this has happened. We don't know when we're going to have a vaccine. We don't know when the uh, uh, movement of cargo is going to go back to normal, especially with most of the land. A lot of that had been benchmarked on the likes of AFC, FTA, and um, the likes of East African community uh, getting their acts together. Where do we stand now? And are we still keeping 17%? Or is it a, just a fluid moment uh, in terms of how we're going to react to this? Um, the target of, um, you know, a growth of export to 17% annually is not going to change, although we know this year and probably the next, it will be very difficult to achieve it. Um, especially um, given one uncertainties on how markets are going to go back to normal, um, what we call normal, I say, quote. Um, this pandemic, I think, has brought uh, so much uncertainties and no one can really forecast um, accurately when we will get out of it. It's being contained and, and we're happy to see also markets or, or countries uh, reopening their economies, but you've seen, you know, in, in, in several countries around the world that sometimes they need to lock down cities, not the whole countries necessarily, and we're trying as much as we can to sort of uh, prevent the second wave, as they call it. As much as our exports were hit, there were some actually um, areas in non-traditional exports, for instance, if we take horticulture, if we take also mining and refined um, uh, gold, for instance, is one. We've seen the price of gold shoot up. This is due to also the uncertainties, which sort of mitigated um, our, 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 the slowdown of our exports from January to July. Uh, the growth of total exports went up to 15%. But on the other hand, we've seen also that imports are going up, um, you know, especially uh, imports of uh, be it, uh, you know, medical supply, uh, preventive um, uh, health equipments, which, which has um, sort of a weight on our, on, our, on our trade deficits, which normally we have a target to really reduce substantially. Uh, but we're also trying to see uh, you know, um, one, by diversifying our export markets so that we support our exporters and, and that they can sort of, um, you know, um, reduce the impact of, of some of the markets they lost and so forth. And this is something we had already 
uh, started doing as part of the Made in Rwanda initiative and, and enlarging our, 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 our export base. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and we're hoping that uh, as also be the IMF or the World Bank uh, predicts that by 2022 we go back to our growth levels being on GDP and also our exports. Uh, but these two years are really challenging for us, but we see that there was still a growth in exports in the first seven months of this year. Enough of the pessimism, let's, let's, let's get some light into, into this. Um, AFCFTA operationalization has been moved to December. Um, Made in Rwanda campaign had picked momentum uh, before uh, March. Um, but uh, one of the major challenges between they and if Rwanda is to take advantage of AFCFTA uh, is cost of export, cost of transport uh, for many, many of the goods that we are producing. Um, exporting them, you know, is more expensive than manufacturing some of these, some of these goods. Uh, what is the plan for that so that a country like Rwanda can take advantage of the AFCFTA? Um, I, I think uh, already, I mean, for anyone who was not convinced of, of um, the crucial role of having, um, you know, a free trade area uh, in Africa uh, has been convinced by this pandemic. Uh, you cannot be an African country and rely solely on, 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 on countries that are outside your continent and outside of your region. Um, and, and I think inter economic integration now is coming crucial. Uh, we're in a world where we expect to have more pandemics in the future, meaning that you will rely more and more on your neighboring countries being in trade, but also on the supply you need, the raw material you need for your industries. Um, what the Made in Rwanda had already achieved is, is, is sort of buy-in, be it by the Rwandan consumer, but also a private sector on, 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 on the, you know, consuming what is made locally, but also for the manufacturing sector, make, making sure what, that, what they put on the market is of good quality in competitive products. And I think through the Rwanda Standards Board, but also the Rwanda Foods and Drugs um, Authority, Rwanda FDA, this is something that they continue not only to work on making sure that products we have on the market are of high quality and supporting our uh, industries and companies to really uh, um, you know, manufacture um, uh, products that are, you know, are not substandard, but also can be competitive compared to what imports we bring in. Um, and then the CFTA, which starts officially um, on the 1st of January 2021, where countries that have uh, ratified and are now negotiating, um, you know, tariff offers and so forth can start trading under the CFTA. So meaning our largest market as Rwanda will be the whole, uh, I would say the 54 countries that have um, signed on the agreement and still ratifying. Um, and and, and uh, the cost of course of transport, and this is why I think intra-African trade is, is one, how are we linked with each other? Do we have railways in place? Do we have roads in place? And what are the non-tariff barriers that we need to address? Um, and, and, and this is, uh, I think, a moment where uh, we're digging into um, those speci uh, specifics, even within the ESC, which is one of the most integrated uh, REC that we have, we still see some non-tariff barriers that we, tr uh, we address uh, through discussions at ESC level, bilateral level, uh, and then on the continental level, we will do the same things. And, and I think it's a great thing that we now have a date um, that we start trading and, and uh, you know, through this transition period, see what the impact on, on intra-African trade will be. We're projecting that intra-African trade would be growing by 20% annually and uh, in the first five years, uh, which is still very That's low. That's very optimistic, eh? <laughs> <laughs> but, it's still, but it's still very low because, you know, when we see 17, 18% of intra-African trade... Uh, is, is that growing? By each year, or by each year, twenty percent. So, in five years, you have almost a uh, hundred percent growth. Hopefully, but a hundred percent growth means we would still trade at thirty-four percent 
uh, whereas Asia is at 69% in Europe. So it's, it's... What are the major barriers and why has it taken us so long to trade with each other? Um, I wish I would have a definite answer. It's more complex, but I think there was also a mindset of, uh, you know, uh, Africa exporting to other countries outside of Africa. The fact also that our manufacturing capacity was still very low. So we, were, we still export mainly raw materials that is then, you know, um, I would say, uh, you know, there's value addition outside of our continent and comes back. So each country now has to build its own manufacturing capability to be able to trade with other countries. So that it's, it's, it's both. We can open our market as much as we want, but if we don't have products to trade with each other, uh, it will not work. So it's, it's sort of, uh, um, I would say, homework put uh, on us as Africans to also have competitive products that we can trade with each other. If we are to bounce back, and uh, if you'd give advice to someone out there who wants to set up a business, who may have some cash stashed away or gold reserve somewhere mm -hmm. and they want to invest in Rwanda, uh, what industries do you think uh, would be most attractive at this time? Um, so maybe if I, you know, speak about, you know, our docket in, in the Ministry of Trade Industry and uh, due into manufacturing, uh, the priority sectors that we have and which we we need investments in our, you know, agro processing because we still need to uh, sort of uh, add value to our agricultural products, be it on dairy products, agricultural products. We have light manufacturing, which includes garments and textile. This is really a sector that, you know, still needs a lot of, of, of players and, and for mass production. And uh, we're happy to see that we've, uh, you know, we've had some investment being, uh, you know, local um, business people, also international, uh, that have already set up manufacturing, um, uh, I would say, um, manufacturing units here in garment and textile, but we still have room, uh, not only for our domestic market, but to be able also to export in the regional market. Um, and then also now I think pharmaceuticals, uh, we have now uh, two companies that uh, will start operations hopefully this year, uh, be it uh, Apex Biotech and Leaf Pharmaceuticals. Um, and and, and uh, I, I think, uh, you know, in the construction uh, material sector, our construction is still growing and uh, we're still importing a lot of construction materials and, and uh, for instance, I would cite that uh, our second uh, local cement producer has started this month, Prime Cement, uh, which will complement uh, Cimera. Uh, so th there's still a, a lot of sectors to, to invest in. And, and, and uh, you know, that there's um, a new investment code as well that gives subsidies to those priority sectors. So I think this is uh, a moment to also look at opportunities, not only, uh, you know, the limitations that the pandemic has imposed on us, but also the fact that there are sectors that still needs investments in that have a market out there. And, and the last, of course, would be uh, in digital trade. Um, I think, you know, online, um, Online uh, trading e-commerce is, is something that the government will continue to invest in, that we also want more startups uh, in this area. Thank you for making the time, Minister. Thank you very much. That was Rwanda's Minister of Trade, Soraya Hakuzi Arimia, speaking to us here at CNBC Africa on the impact COVID-19 has had on Rwanda's balance of trade position. But not only that, what other opportunities in there. You have been watching the CNBC Africa special. My name is Arnold Quizera. Tweet us at CNBC Africa or tag me directly at The Real Quizera to join the conversation. Have a great rest of your day.